Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Um, today is, what is the date today? Today is May 9th, Monday, May 9th. Monday Madness, right? Um, today, we have a, another special guest for Recovery Roundtable. And her name is Samantha Lindgren, uh, Flies to the Sky woman. And she is from MHG Nation. And um, real quick, I'm just going to get this set up so that way um, I can see all of the live feed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And questions, because we will open up the floor tonight for questions. Um, just like we did last week. Um, we will open up the floor for anybody that has questions after Miss um, Lindgren is able to give her testimony, share her story, um, and um, go from there if anybody has any questions in the meantime. So I apologize. I look kind of a mess. Don't feel so great. I think I have like a sinus thing going. <laughs> um, so if you can't hear me, let me know. Please, please let me know and uh, I will speak up. So, um, let me see here. Need to figure out again how to add my person in. And looks like Sam is here. And let's see. I would like to bring you on camera. How? I don't know why it's not, um, oh, not sure why it's not adding you in, Sam. Um, let's see, let's figure it out again. We're going to have the same issue probably. <laughs> so I am so sorry once again. Um, in the meantime, how was everybody's Mother's Day? I know it's another holiday. Um, it's another um, time where uh, there could be triggers involved um, and you know other other things that could be happening in your lifetime um, or your life excuse me um, I know that um, holidays are a hard time for people um, you know people in recovery and you know just people in general people across the world that have experienced things experienced um, the loss of a loved one, um, you know, that's really hard. So, um, just want to let you know that, um, you know, we're here for you. We're here to support you. If you have any, um, you know, anything that you want to share as far as a group, um, or just one-on-one, -on -one, um, you can reach out to myself. I know Sam is a really, really awesome support, um, she is a certified peer support, so that's pretty awesome. Um, and again, I'm trying to figure out here. And I apologize, my voice is kind of scratchy too, just not feeling awesome. Um, and let's see. I think what has to happen, I think somebody has to be a group member and then when they pop up they can um, it, it gives the option to um, add you to the the live video so that's kind of what I'm trying to get going here um, today was a really cool day uh, we uh, myself and some other ladies from the Youth and Family Tree program. Um, we got to go to um, Wakapala District's May School and we spoke with um, grades 6 through 12 um, at their school and we talked about um, opioids, we talked about um, the use of Narcan, um, some of the ladies shared their own personal experience which was really cool and so um, we had a good time there. We had a good turnout. Um, it's a smaller school, right? But um, it it had a good turnout. There was a lot of kids there. There were kids that um, 
were interacting, which was really nice to see. Um, questions and suggestions and all that. So that was really cool. Um, so I consider today to be a good day. We got to reach out to the youth. Um, we got to share some really good information with the youth. And um, I just think that's really special. So um, I'm trying to see here. Oh. Hmm. What the heck? Nope. I don't even have an option to add you, Sam. I don't even know what's going on here. Meanwhile, I had a week to figure it out, but I am such a procrastinator. It's not even funny. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, let's see. Everybody else has the option to bring them on camera, so why not Sam, why not you? Um, well, in the meantime, um, I'm just gonna call Sam in and we'll just kind of do what we did last time and then while we're doing that, I'll just kind of fiddle with this and hopefully we can get you on camera. Okay, Sam? So I will give you a call and just give me just a minute. Call <clears throat> has been forwarded to an automated. Your call has been. Hi, I don't know what the heck is going on. So, are you okay if I just add you in by call for a minute and then we'll kind of fiddle with it? Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Awesome. All right, so we have Sam on the line here, Samantha Lindgren, and um, Sam, if you would you mind introducing yourself, and we'll just kind of do a mic check to make sure everybody can hear you. Is that okay? Yep. Awesome. So my name is Samantha Lindgren. Can you guys hear me? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Keep going. We'll just. Okay. Awesome. All right. So. We have Sam on the line here, Samantha Oopsie. Lindgren. Hey. And, uh, is it on a deal right now? Meanwhile. Yep. Okay. We're good. <laughs> okay. All right. So my name is Samantha Lindgren. I'm an enrolled member of MHA Nation. I have four years of recovery. My recovery birth date is December 21st, 2017. Well, we're doing I am a mother to... Many, many kids, but I have two biological sons and two biological daughters. I have my 16 year old that lives with me now that I'm in recovery, and my 13 year old I have a visitation with on weekends, and my 13 year old is actually cousins with Brooklyn's son. So, yes. Brooklyn actually, you know, I go way back. Um, <laughs> she knew me in between my relapses, and, um, she was a struggling student. I babysat for her, and, and we really got to know each other. And it's awesome to see each other on this side of the the sun now. I'm in recovery, and she's she's doing boss moves. <laughs> so Thank I you. appreciate the invitation. So yeah, my recovery story. It's I, I've been an addict since I was. I mean, I started drinking alcohol when I was 12 years old. I had all the makings of of being an addict. Um, I was sexually abused when I was younger. I was a child of two addicts. My mom was the dual diagnosis. Um, before that was even something that was recognized. She had gone to treatment. It just didn't work. Majority of her, hers was alcoholism, uh, with some drug addiction. My dad was, a was a drinker. Um, he was a functioning, high functioning drinker. And so um, they weren't they weren't really together a whole lot. I was I, I have a I think my dad just saw her as the perfect girlfriend. He was forty six in his mid late mid forties, and she was in her late twenties. And she was supposed to have kids, and well, get a fertile chip out of data data young woman, and here here I am. <laughs> so uh, they had such a tumultuous relationship because of their addiction and. So they were never really together, so I, was, I started out in a broken home, and a single mom working two jobs, and we lived with my grandma, and, 
and then I had plenty of cousins, and I'm the youngest of my dad's seven kids, and he was he was a good dad. My mom, for the most, you know, outside of her addiction, she was a really good mom, and uh, she just relied a lot on outside child care, and, and that's where the sexual abuse started when I was younger, and it wasn't just one babysitter, it was numerous babysitters, and and I, I didn't, I had repressed those memories. I, I knew at 12, there, you know, my mom was physically abusive with her alcoholism and it was tough. And um, growing up, and I always kind of knew I was self medicating something away, but I never knew what it was. And um, it started at 12, she was a bartender. I, I would go into the bar and I grew up in that bar and it was nothing to nab a bottle here and there. I mean, I did it for my brothers and my sisters. Um, Maybe my brother, my brother would say, he'd be like, hey, if you're at the bar with mom, you should, you know. And I started out, like, just, I was, like, so young, I, I didn't realize any the sarcasm behind it. But I remember when I did it, because there was no reason for me to do it. My dad had alcohol in the house, you know. They, they were older than me. They could get alcohol. But I remember I did it, and I remember thinking, like, ooh, that was really easy. And so that triggered something in me. And um, I started, I started coffee drinking, and I remember it wasn't just one thing, and it wasn't beer, it was with, like liquor. And it wasn't so much I liked the feeling of it, and it wasn't so much I liked the hangover of it. It was just, I knew I was self-medicating something, I just couldn't pinpoint what it was. And then I get into my early teens, and I found weed, which I, it was, that wasn't too hard either, because, um... I knew plenty of people growing up that smoked weed. I saw my mom smoke weed when I was younger. And I guess it was it was quite odd. I kind of stumbled upon an out-of-state guy in Minot. And I can't remember what it was. He was significantly older. And I remember I was looking for weed. And he had some. And he, I remember he gave me this quantity of weed. And he said, here, if you can get rid of this, you know, you can keep whatever you make. And I was like, oh, great, you know. And boom, a drug dealer was born because when I was 14, I was pushing pee um, for this way older guy in Minot who wasn't really from there. And whether that's where he was really from, I, I couldn't tell you to this day. And at 15, I um, I had stumbled upon a uh, crank. I went to a neighbor's house and my um, step cousin and my friend were sitting upstairs, I remember seeing them smoking on a sleigh bump, and, and I had just, I'd gone to something really traumatic, you know, a couple weekends before that night, I hadn't really recovered, and so here, I stumbled upon them, and they just put the pen to my mouth, and they just start, you know, lighting this up, and they're like, suck until you can't expect anymore, I was like, okay, so I started sucking, and he was like, holy crap, quit, quit, <coughs> And I went stuck and I just kept going and going. I remember this big cloud came out and I remember I looked at both of them and their eyes were already buggy because, you know, it's amphetamines. And I look and I'm like, what? He goes, oh, God. Oh, my God. And I was like, what? And I remember it fell my hand me and I was like, oh, God, I don't like this feeling. Take it away. Take it away. Because I was such a pothead that, that I, you know, I like my boundaries. And I was like, take it away. Oh, man, I was up for like five days trying to hide it from my mom. And I was going to school. And I was working a job trying to figure out why I couldn't, like, I hated it. I hated that feeling. I couldn't smoke enough weed. I couldn't drink enough alcohol. There was no coming off of this. And I was, like, wigging out. He was, like, freaking out because he was, like, don't freak out. Don't get because Everybody was scared of my mom. So he was like, don't, don't, don't. And I remember... She caught on to me about day four, and she was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, nothing. Nothing's wrong with me. And I remember they were just wigging out and finding that fifth day when I fell asleep and I was done. It was it. I fell asleep on a Friday, and I didn't wake up until Monday morning. They thought, I don't know what my grandma thought, but I know she was freaked out. I remember being really crabby, really irritable, and I was like, wow, never again. So I stuck to smoking weed well then I go up to a friend of mine's house and he was looking for weed and he was like yeah I don't have any weed but I got some coke and I was like okay well yeah I'll try that so I did a lot of coke and I started to have some weed for coke and then man I, I like that feeling way better 
but I had just seen the white powder and I was just like, oh, please tell me this is COVID. Isn't it really that crane shit missing? He's like, dude, you tried crane? And I was like, yeah. I was like, I can't sleep for five days. What is it? And he was like telling me it was kind of big in the oil field in Williston during that time in the mid 90s. And, you know, he was like, I can't believe you tried that. And I was like, I didn't even know what I was doing. And then I got help for that. Smith, that you don't do that. So I was like, but it was my, you know, it was my stepdad saying it was my friend. And he was like, you can't trust everybody's intentions. And I would later learn that that year I went to homecoming and I decided to drink and I decided to do some drugs and mix my poisons. And I ended up getting raped that night by two people I trusted <clears throat> that I had used with. And I remember vaguely coming in and out of it. I remember being really, really drunk. And I remember coming to and it was happening and I was like no this isn't happening and here I was you know 15 15 and a half and trying to figure out you know like how how did this happen like you know I trust be you know and I kept hearing my you know I kept hearing these words you know you can't trust everybody and so I decided okay alcohol was the cause for that if I wouldn't have been drunk I wouldn't have blacked out that wouldn't have happened and so I decided I wasn't going to drink anymore. So I decided I wasn't going to drink anymore, and I watched numb all of this pain. What I decided to do was um, I decided just to to become a drug addict. It, you know, subconsciously, I was I was still pushing drugs, and now I'm on coke, and, and I just became an equal opportunist of anything that was going to take that pain away. Because a week went by, and I remember I came home, and my mom was super, super intoxicated, and I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong, and she said, sit down, and I said, what? And she said, I heard you were at this party last week, just passing yourself around like you were candy, you know, I'm so ashamed of you, and I was like, that's not what happened. Yep, no, 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 you know, it came from this, you know, really good source, and she was just, you know, beside herself, and, and it turned into this super physical altercation, like, horrible, so not only am I recovering from a rape I'm not talking about, now I'm, I'm also, you know, being punished for, you know, not, not speaking up about what had happened, and, and so in that moment, I, I shut down, and I didn't tell anybody, what had happened I took the shame because I went to school and these two guys were um going around spreading stories or whatever and I was shamed in the hallways and and I remember that was one of the pivotal moments early in my addiction to where I just quit caring I did not give two f's about my life or or what I was putting into it or what I was doing to myself and my schoolwork started fading. I dropped out of school. I got my GED. I started working for AmeriCorps um, through Fort Berthold Housing. Um, and and I was just going through motions. And I found a way to work a job where I could be an addict and still function. And I had gotten my GED. And I would eventually go back to high school. But I just... Um, I spiraled, and in the meantime, I wanted to tell my mom so bad, like, what had happened, but one of the guys, is both, actually, both the guys' moms um, were friends of hers, and I knew if I opened up, she was going to say, who? And like I said, people were terrified of her. And I could about imagine what she was going to do, and I just wanted to die. I just wanted that moment in time to die. And um, so... We go forward a few months, and we find out she's terminally ill, and um, I start going to homeschool, and still using, still taking off, still partying, uh, still, you know, making drug runs, and to my not and back, and just on my spiral, well, then they, I had to start staying with her in the hospital when she was admitted two weeks at a time, and, you know, doctors are staying two years, and, and... Come March, I remember it was St. Patrick's Day, and she was just really uncomfortable on the couch. And I, I was her home health care, and I wasn't able to pull blood pressure up for her for that since that day before it was weakening. And she made me promise not to tell her because she didn't want to go back to the hospital. She said, This is it, this is it. And I said, Okay. And um, I remember sitting there as long as I could, and she told me I should go to bed. So I went to bed, and 
I wake up the next morning to my aunt banging on the door saying they couldn't, you know, she was incoherent. They were waiting for the ambulance and trying to take care of everything. And I get up and I see her and she's really uncomfortable. And I, she grabs my hand and it, using her hand just a lack of circulation. It was really cold, but I remember it being really warm. And I said, I have to tell you something, you know. And, and she said, I know. And I said, I don't think you know. And she had this moment of peace. And I remember I leaned into her ear and I said, Mama, I never did that. This whole time I've been trying to tell you that I got raped by both those boys. And I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I I, I can't. I don't want you living. I said, I, I can't have you not make it and not know the truth. And um, she had this moment of clarity and she grabbed my hand and she whispered in my ear. And she said, I'm so sorry you felt you couldn't tell me that, um, but get a doctor that, you know, she was just like, I choose to live, I choose to live, and and she was fighting for life, and my aunt and I left, and we go get uh, Dr. Naranja, and by the time we had brought her back, my mom was uh, gone, mm-hmm. but my aunt said, go take a shower, you're going to you're gonna ride with her in an ambulance, and I did, and when I came out, they had declared that she had passed away, and um <clears throat> right in front of me so I had all these traumas and I remember thinking like you know my I remember thinking in that moment my life was forever altered right then and there it, it was never going to be the same I remember feeling bad for myself and I remember I looked at my grandma and I was like what am I supposed to do without a mom and she looked at me and she just said what am I supposed to do parents aren't supposed to outlive their children this is against God's will and I that haunted me and I and I you know, she looked at me and she said, I pray you never, or none of my grandkids or any of my kids will ever know this pain. And I just remember holding my grandma and she had told me she had heard what I had said to my mom. <clears throat> and I and I intended it. I wasn't being quiet about it at that point. And she just gave me a hug and she said, you know, I'm sorry you went through that all by yourself. And you felt you couldn't tell anybody that. And, you know, how hard that must have been for you. And. And I said, this isn't about me now, Grandma. This is about you. This is about Mom. Let's just get through this. Cause I didn't want to talk about it with her. And truth be told, I had gotten fucked up. I was all messed up. And I just went to the bathroom, and I had gotten messed up on a bunch of coke and, you know, and, and some pills. And I didn't even know what they were. I just think that they were pills. So I took them. And, and she was like, okay. She said, but, you know, we got to get the get you better somehow. And I remember her telling me, like, she knew. I was like, what? And she said, you know, I know what you're going through. And I, and I just never really elaborated on it until years down the road, what she was implying. So we fast forward, and, and I start, I get in touch with, with my aunt, and that's crazy. And I'm trying to be an addict, and I get DUI. I mean, I, I, just, I just, I lost all grips of reality. I had no cares still. And I remember... Um, my aunt sent me to the group home system here in Bismarck and I started getting on the up and up and I was back in high school my grades are good I'm, I'm working and getting back on my feet my grandma was so proud of me and it, it was hard for her to be away from me and um, and she just told me she knew I wasn't in a good way so she knew that the absence was necessary so I said okay you know and and we got to a point where my dad had been lied to. He was looking for me, and he, I guess I told them he wanted custody of me. If they didn't want me, he wanted me, and he was going to fight, and he filed in tribal court. So I had two options, which one was to go to Montana, or one was to go with him, and I chose to go to Montana with my maternal aunt. And um, I would meet my, my high school sweetheart there, who would be an alcoholic, and... We would have my oldest son, Devin, when we were 19. Um, so I met him there, and I also met a really good friend, and her name was Michael. And, you know, student athlete, had everything going for her, you know, um, and just was all around. I think she was all state. She was sponsored by Nike, you know, good influence, and... Um, you know, loved her to death, and I would turn, ooh, let's see, I'm at Western High School, so fast forward a few months, 
I move in with him, and Fuji and I are still, you know, Michael and I are still hanging out. We're still friends, and she's dating her older boyfriend, who happens to be a drug dealer. And kind of, kind of crazy how you know you, you get that vibe, and that's what you attract around you. And Fuji and I would spiral. It was her nickname. Nickname was Fuji, so we would spiral together for years. In and. and I would have brief bouts of sobriety, and sometimes I've been brief. There, you know, I would get a year. You know, I was blessed that I didn't use during my pregnancies. I didn't use while I was nursing. I would stay straight for a while, and then I would just dabble, and then I would fall off. But I was able to re—I was able to pull it back up, you know, back in. And um, it was. You know, and talking to my ex-husband, he feels a lot of a lot of blame or a lot of shame for it. And because he said he knew what was going on, but he didn't, at that point in time in our lives, he didn't know how to save me. You know, he said, I saw you wither away. He was like, I would watch you, you know, drop 20 pounds and you'd be gone for days and all of a sudden you'd be back, you know. And that, that was the start of Devin's young life was, was those absences. Nicholas, I lost SP Jim at two. Um, his dad and I used to abuse pills together, and um, that's where painkillers came in, was shortly, you know, in the early 2000s there, and after he was born, and during that relapse, and and we just, and that was a, just a crappy relationship, and, you know, we just ended up having a son together that, that we tried to make it work, and we couldn't because of our addiction, so I, I lost custody of my son to him and his family. And I would go further, and, and eventually Wes and I would, would go bust, and I, I would end up with Devin, and, you know, I was high-functioning. Uh, for the most part at that time, I was drug dealing. And, you know, was, when I talk about Bootsy, she we were both going to school and have her um, online. And so we had one week a month where we had to go up to have her, and we had to be in, in class, and then the rest of it was done online. And so those weeks we'd go up together and we were, you know, I, I was meeting my supplier and I would, you know, pick up and if I didn't shake it there and have her, I was bringing it back down to the res. And these were some heavy hitters. These were heavy hitter Mexicans and, um, like followed me. They knew my son's name. They knew where I lived. They knew where, you know, Michael lived. Um, <laughs> threatened our you know our family's well-being you know if you don't do this and and it was second nature to me I, I just it wasn't it wasn't as scary as it should have been because of my habit so now at this point I'm on I'm on I'm on coke pretty steady and then I pick up meth um and meth had come in at 18 my first time it was nothing for me to get rid of I picked it up in Texas just on a on a random run that I was going on with the with the connection I still had, but this one required now that I was eighteen and able to go to prison, I had to prove at eighteen that I wasn't gonna run my mouth. So that was the first time I was ever injected with methamphetamine was during that time in Texas to make sure I could one handle my drugs, two, um, you know, in hindsight, they could have trafficked me for all I knew, and, and nobody would have even known where I was. Um, three, and it was to see if I was going to be able to keep my wits about me if I needed to, and and I passed the test. And I didn't really like the super duper high of the needle, so I, I was more I would smoke, I would snort it, I would do a hot rail, and not even consistently because I knew better better than to get high on my own supply. So I was using just as a pick-me-up. Um, if I didn't have Coke, I, w- I would do a small line of dope or a small line of meth and get myself pick-me-up and go get my pushing done, and then I would have to work a full-time job plus going to school, plus being the mom. Um, husband's deployed at that time. I'm just doing, you know, just just doing it. And it, it wasn't intrusive. Like I said, it was high-functioning, and... Hanging out with um, Hootsie would be very detrimental. She was somebody that 
that they had gotten really super duper high and I don't know if it was her or her boyfriend she was still with and she just got so high that she's permit fried and, and, and it's really a tragic I didn't realize that was going to be an issue until you know she had gotten so high and to this day nobody knows where she is she's maybe in Billings her kids are being raised by family and their dads um our friendship dissipated I think in 2012 maybe 2014 she had hit me up and wanted to come stay with me she wanted me to straighten her up and I and I couldn't have her around me because I wasn't flying straight at that point either so I, I said I couldn't and I I, I do regret that because I don't know if I could have saved her not in the condition I was in we probably would have just been in the same cycle so I I you know I've been told she's still alive, but we don't know where. Um, I was told she was, you know, selling herself. Uh, to, you know, she was hanging out with different kinds of people. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things, but I, I have yet to ever hear from her as of lately. Um, and I and I pray that, you know, she's doing well. Like I said, this is a Nike-sponsored, all-state, awesome person when she's not using like any of us are. And to see her fall to that debt, and it all started with us, you know, her meeting her boyfriend, me getting this connection, and, you know, going to school in Haver, and I finished up my semester, and bombed out of it, of course, and, and, um, got myself really intertwined in this, this shady, shady world, and on and off using needles, on and off doing hot rails, on and off doing lines, just just going in and out of it and <coughs> I know I fell onto the feds radar in the mid 2000s because of this trafficking and, and, and going in and out <coughs> was kicked off the res um, in Montana one of the reses in Montana I was kicked off because of not being enrolled and I was deemed a threat to their enrolled members because of my activity and so we moved to Bismarck, 2000. I, my husband and I get divorced um, after I moved to Bismarck, but we were separated. And in 2000, August 2007, I moved to Bismarck, and it was under this vow that I was going to straighten up because that is how I met um, my 16-year-old dad. My 16-year-old daughter, Kylie, her dad was using. Um, we were both drug dealers. He was on the lower end of the scale than I was. And... Um, I did just got this urge to quit using, and lo and behold, I found out I'm pregnant, and and so I quit. And another tumultuous, crazy relationship, and I ended up fleeing um, from it with whatever I have in my car, with my daughter Devin's already, you know, in North Dakota. I stopped in Utah, picked him up, and we moved to Bismarck to start over. I made a vow that I was going to quit, and I did for a few years and uh, met a family member that was pretty toxic uh, to me and I don't really have a relationship with her. I mean, we've started talking as of this year, but um, I have a lot of resentments to work through, but I invited her into my life and and that, that relapse would <clears throat> lead me all the way into New England prison doors. I... Uh, went from not having one felony to, I think, if you look on my record, I think eight to 11 felonies. Uh, mostly drug related. If not, you can see the demise. You can see the buildup happening of how this would all go about. And I lost, when I became a real active, active addict to where I, I actually had started backing away from pushing. And that was my goal because, you know, the rule of thumb is there's no way out of this lifestyle unless it's prison or death. And, and um, I wanted out. I, 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 you know, I didn't want this burden of these people on my back anymore. I didn't want to be their backing call. I didn't, I didn't want to traffic. I didn't, I, I was tired. I've been doing this for so long. And, and I tried explaining that and, and, you know, I, I thought, you know, I, I've showed my worth, you know, I, I've, I've, I even handed off my, my source to another person and I feel horrible. They're now indicted and sitting on a 10 year sentence in prison because of the connection I introduced them to. And, 
Um, um, but I sat here and I just, I wanted out. And I remember I had really had to start pushing and moving in Bismarck, Mandan. So I buy this trailer and I remodel it. And it's really nice, and I develop a system, and I meet some solid people, and and I and I get the game built pretty good here. And I've got three pushers, and I don't know who they've got, but I've got the same three solid people. We've got a solid system, and um, I picked up the needle, and and it was more needle than anything else. And I remember slowly getting like sick. And I was trying to figure out why, like, I mean, it was just meth. Why, why do I feel like this? And I remember the plug, you know, being, oh, well, I know you don't cut your stuff. He was like, but we've been cutting it with heroin. Mm-hmm. So the heroin is meant to um, make you dope sick, make you crave the meth. Even, even though you don't know you're doing heroin, it's meant to cause the same dope sickness like a heroin addict feels. So essentially that's what I was feeling was I was feeling dope sick and I was, I just had to do a little bit more and a little bit more. And then finally I remember it was just like, well, holy shit, like make this go away. And he said, I don't have any more meth to like cut this into. He was like, I just have like, he was like, I maybe have some black tar and I, I had done black tar before. Um, and I was like, just here, I said, I'll buy you. I was like, I don't like this. I am so sick right now. And my girls were little my son was being raised in Newtown at this point and so there I did I took my took my little bit of black heroin went to my bathroom and I was just disappointed I was like god this is not my life like I cannot believe this is it this is the one thing you know I said if I ever picked up heroin because like there's a system where if you're an alcoholic well at least I'm not on drugs and you pick up drugs well I'm just a pothead it's not like I'm on anything heavy so then you pick up something a meth head will say, oh my gosh, well, at least I'm not on heroin or fentanyl. And then you pick up heroin, and then the heroin addicts are like, oh, well, at least I'm not smoking fent- fentanyl. Pretty soon you're smoking fentanyl, doing dope, and heroin. You know, it's just the way it happens. And I I just, I remember right before I put that shot of heroin in my arm, you know, shot of heroin in my arm, I just thought, oh my God, this can't be my life. This, this, I can't, but my will to not feel sick was so much stronger than the common sense of like there's no going back after you do this and boom I did it and I fell out instantaneously like I wasn't smart like I didn't sit down before I did this shot of heroin I'm standing and I remember like seeing the corner of this thing and I remember I hit mm-hmm. it and I remember hearing the think you know and I was just like but I couldn't open my eyes and I couldn't stop it so I sat there and I hit the you know I hit and and the guys were there, and they opened up the door, and they're like, holy, sh-, you know, is she okay? And I remember they're like, oh, my God, she Narcan her? Is she overdosing? And they moved me into my room, and I remember hearing one of my daughters cry, like, what's wrong with my mom? And mm-hmm. you would think, you would think, hearing that, I would have stopped right there. And that's when I realized, okay, I, I have no grasp on this addiction. <laughs> And I called my family, and I told my family, um, I need you to come get my kids. I, I, I'm not in a good way. And they were there 24 hours later. And um, to get Kylie, <clears throat> because Jazzy was already with her dad, because I had gotten thrown in jail, and my niece had them. And, and they had given, he came up to me, he took Jazzy right away. And so I get out, and my niece tells me it's be a story and I didn't care, you know, so a week later here I am shooting heroin in my arm and my poor daughter Kylie is left with me and so, you know, I come to and I call my family, they come and get them, come and get her and that's it. Now I have, now I have no kids and I have no reason to slow down and that was it. That's, that's, that's all it took. I started pushing dope. I started pushing heroin. I started getting my hands on fentanyl pills. I remember smoking fentanyl on a foil and thinking like, man, this is, you know, and and I remember them telling me like, you know, you can't gauge this, this can kill you, make sure you've got Narcan. But you know, if you're gonna come with that warning at me, but 
you know, and make sure I have Narcan. You know, I can't Narcan myself. I'm overdosed. Like, I found that out the hard way. Um, and and it just brought a different class of people when I when I went into that junkie mode of um, doing anything and everything. And, and finally, I, I called the plug, and I was just like, I'm going to go to prison. The cops are on the corner. They're watching my house. I, I don't trust the people that are around me. And I said, I don't want to, I don't want to push. And so that night I cleaned, I cleared out my whole house that night, just off a pure hunch, got rid of my safe, got rid of, I just had enough for personal, maybe a couple rigs, a couple needles so I could get high. And I left, I left my house for three days and I come back to my house and I'm trying to fall out of my bed. I'm, I'm dope sick. And I've decided I'm going to give it another go. And I try to straighten myself up because I wanted to go home with my kids. And boom, Metro Area Task Force, Mandan PD. I mean, all I see is I hear them yelling my name. I'm on the ground. Um, and I was barefoot and got hauled to, to jail. And I get out the next day because they, they didn't have a warrant to enter my home. And I get out the next day um, on a bond. And I go home. And my house has been robbed because the people that had called me in said I had my small kids there. I had mass amounts of drugs and money and all this other stuff were neighbors of mine that I'd helped out. But the next door neighbor to me had told me here and he showed me his camera system and you see the cops roll up. You see my neighbors pointing at my door. Um, and they had called me in and then after the cops had held me away, they, they robbed my house. Um, so the only thing I was left with was a, a few outfits. I mean, they robbed my daughter's room. They robbed my son's room. Um, everything. Everything I've been taking out electronics. I mean, I was I was left with, like, maybe some outfits and my drugs. So I was I was done. I was just, I, I was pissed at God. I was pissed at Creator. They're going to keep letting me take these hits because, you know, it's not my fault. Mm-hmm. It's Creator's fault because I'm going to keep taking these hits and, and, be this 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 hot mess of an addict and uh, you know it's it's because of what he or she allowed to happen to me not not what I am choosing to do with it and so that next summer I would spend in and out of jail the next fall I would spend in and out of jail um I I had recently told somebody you know I went to jail and I knew I was going to be sentenced to prison because of the probation didn't want me no more um, I don't have a solid address. The likes of the people. Um, I felt like I was being targeted by police. And if you guys ever look on my page, you'll see all of my addict pictures. And uh, I did not see myself as, you know, 86 pounds. I didn't see somebody with just a skeletal, you know, shot out arms. I mean, I look horrible. My ponytail, nobody told me while I was walking around with a receding hairline and that weak ass ponytail behind my head and um, small size four, if even that, I got down to a size zero. And I and that's I just had no regard. I, I didn't have my kids, my kids were mad, they didn't want to talk to me. Um, didn't want to you know, didn't and I and I can understand that now. And I'm happy that they were, because I don't know if I, you know, outside of the mugshots they see now or any of that, like, I don't know if I would want them to see me in that condition. I mean, they'd already seen so much in their young lives, so I was okay with it, but that really fueled my addiction, because now it was for me, nobody wants to bond me out of jail, I have no friends, I have no this, you know, every time I got out of jail, I, I could call my family and be like, okay, they're letting me out. And they would be there. But my plug was there, or my friends at youth would be there, and boom, there's a freshly loaded needle. You know, let's go have some fun. Okay, well, it's fun that first night, and then all of a sudden you have nowhere to go, and you got no money. And, you know, I, I went underground. I went missing for, I think, 14 months of that of that time, and I was on 18 months of probation. And, and my sister got involved in MMIW because nobody had heard from me. Nobody had talked to me. Um, I had gotten kidnapped by dealers for like $200. I didn't even owe that debt. I remember laughing like, you just got to take me to the bank. But nobody wants to take me to the bank. It's $200 out. 
And I was like, is this going to take my life? $200 really is, we're, we're going to, you're going to hold me hostage for $200. And then, then they're calling like my family for like $2,000. And I'm like, I can give you $1,000. You just gotta, I just gotta go to the bank. And I'm trying to get out of the grips. And it just kind of came to of like, you know, I remember I was sitting in this house, like with a gun to my head thinking like is this my life oh my god is this you know and I continuously ask myself my addiction like this is not my life it's like what am I doing and here I was just like you know what if they were going to shoot me they would have shot me by now and I got I got by the chair and I started walking to the door and he's like where do you think you're going and I was just like man I'm going to go get you some money because if you really think you're going to hold a gun to my head and I keep telling you just let me go to the bank come on bro I was like, I'll be back. No, you're just going to take off here. I was like, dude, I'll be f- here. I'm going, you know. And so I do. I, I went right to the bank there. And then, then I walked my happy ass there. And I come back and I put this. I was like, do you want 200 or 2,000? And they were like, what? I was like, what is my life worth? Is it 200 or 2,000? And he was looking at me and he goes, 2,000. So I put the 2,000 on the counter and I was like, are we squared? And he looks at me and he goes, Yeah. I was like, okay, and I grabbed my backpack, and I head out the door, and I remember thinking, like, wow, my life is only worth $2,000, like, like, they were calling my family, allegedly, and, and I just sat here, and, you know, what a phone call to get, because I, I had been in contact with my family, I didn't want them getting their doors kicked down, because I had so many active warrants, and was gonna go to prison, and, so I kept everybody away from me, and, and that's why I tell myself, you know, I'm protecting them by staying distant, and, you know, I, I wouldn't realize until recovery what that did to them. So I ended up going to prison. I got sentenced to four years, and um, I ended up serving between jail time, prison time, halfway house time. It would total up to five years because um, I just couldn't stay straight. So I got out of prison in 2017 after serving all the jail time from 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. So 2017 is my release date, but I still have to serve two years of super of parole probation. I got out of prison. I get out of the halfway house in May, <laughs> and I'm right back in there. Mm, December 21st, I can tell you at 3 a.m., after my pro officer said, you get here at 9.01, not 9 a.m., not 9.02, 9.01. And I walk in, and I'm like, what? And she said, I have watched people from 150 pounds working two jobs and having an apartment, and in this relapse, you are, you've gotten jumped, which I did, by multiple people. I got my teeth kicked out, my ribs broken after being released from prison in 2017. And um, and it was over a girl that had stolen my car, went into my friend's house, I took a shower, I lost my apartment, I lost both my jobs at this point, and I had my car, and my car's got all my belongings in it, and she was like, yeah, come to my house, take a shower, and I had my drug and alcohol values in that day, so I was sober. Um, and I remember... Um, Somebody popped into the bathroom while this person grabbed my keys <clears throat> and she took off with my car. And I guess it was well plotted between my supposed friend at that time and whatever. So I spend the next week just kind of in shambles. I can't report it stolen. I can't. I'm completely strung out. It's got all my worldly belongings. I've got a bag full of my stuff. I go couch surfing. And finally, my fuel has had enough. And and she had reminded me of something. I, I guess in my relapse, I forgot about it. And she said, Samantha, do you remember how you ended up going to prison? And I said, yeah, I got out of jail. And the judge said, I'm sentencing you to prison in two weeks, more than likely. So go make your amends and your peace and time with your family and kids. And I had was right back in front of him 15 hours later <laughs> on two new charges. So I went to prison. And she said, no. She said, tell me that story about you in a hotel room. And then I said, oh. And I said, well, I said, um, I got sick of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm really, really, like, I'm re- pretty messed up sitting here telling her this story. 
and I said, um, I had checked into a motel room in Mandan with the intention of killing myself and didn't tell anybody where I was at. And I had a 100cc needle filled with dope and heroin and a little bit of fentanyl and turned my phone off and was on my knees praying, legit on my knees praying and telling God, like, either you take me or let me get arrested because I can't do this anymore. And that was my surrender. And I and I took that needle and I remember getting half of it into my body. And that's the last thing I remember until two of my friends had me in a cold shower. And I remember the Narcan making me violently ill. I remember just violently throwing up in this shower and trying not to shit on myself and just it, it just sick. And I was like, where you know where am I? And she's slapping me like. Can't believe you would do this. You know, we thought you were just, we didn't know what was going on. And we peeked over. We just thought you were praying something, you know, if you fell out like that. And she said, oh, my God, you were dead. You were dead. And she was just, her and her sister was just freaked out. And I was just like, oh, my God. You know, and she was like, her sister was like, do I call 911? She was like, no, because I don't know what she's got on her. And she was like, let's just take her to South Dakota. Let's go. We're going to detox her. And that's it. Well, you know, she can turn herself in on her warrants, do whatever she's got to do. I remember my eyes rolling and I remember she had to help shower me and, and I was pissed. All I wanted to do at that time was I looked at my keel and I said, all I want to do is I just want to die. Why would they, why can't they just let me die? And, um, and I remember two hours after that, we're getting ready to go. We gas up and I'm sick in the back of her car and I said the, the I remember her saying we're getting pulled over and by the grace of God now remember I didn't die I wasn't able to kill myself so two hours later I was by myself behind her car being questioned you know what do you have on you and I told anybody in that car whatever you guys have on you just give it to me and they were potheads I took you know their weed and whatever they could get in trouble for and uh, one sister had dope on her and a pipe, and I just, I took all of it, and I go into the trunk, and I was like, here, and I start emptying out my needles, and my heroin, and my dope, and their stuff, and I put it on there, and I look at him, I look at the cop, and he just looked at me, and he goes, is that everything? And I was like, I'm just tired, and I remember crying, and I was like, I'm just tired, I can't do this anymore, this isn't my life, and... And he hugged me, and I remember sitting there, and we're on expressway in front of the mall, and I said, I just want to die. I just, I just want to die. I, was, I prayed to God. I said, either, either take me or put me in jail because I can't quit. I can't do this. I just want to die. And I said, I was dead, and they saved me, and I'm mad. I'm so fucking mad. And he got quiet, and he said, um, we're going to take you to the hospital, and we're going to get you cleared. He said, but I do have to arrest you. And, and I said, I'm taking the charges for all of this. You know, I said, just just stack them up. And he said, I'm giving you, you know, possession. I'll give you possession of methamphetamine. I'm going to give you possession of paraphernalia. He goes, because I've never seen you like this. He said, of all the times I've arrested you. And he cuffed me. And he put me in the back of the cop car. And they took me to the hospital. And they kept me there for about 18 hours. And they cleared me. And I went to the jail. And. And um, I remember just being completely humble, and I was some telling my PO that sitting in her office, you know, December 21st, and and I knew, I knew she was going to re-arrest me, and I told her that story, and she said, um, I'm looking at you, and she, and she said, here are my options, is I can put you in jail, or I can put you in that bed that I have set up for you in the halfway house, because I see a young woman that has lost her way, and she wants to die. She wants to die again. And she said, I've, I've been on the phone with your family. I've, I've been on the phone with numerous people that, that love you. And she said, you're not going to die. I can't I can't let you die. So the option is, yours. are you going to jail and back to prison? Or are you going to sit in a halfway house and do what you have to do? And I was so fucked up because at night, I the night before at 3 a.m., was my last shot of methamphetamine. It's my last shot of heroin. 
and it was going to be able enough to hold me straight for, until I saw her at nine, which was a lie. There I was, you know, eight thirty, getting high again, and um, I go into her office and and do, and I picked the halfway house, and I was there for six months, and in that six months, um, I'm still recovering from getting jumped. Uh, a few weeks before that, after my car had gotten stolen and you know I, I had multiple broken ribs I had a, a broken jaw my teeth had been kicked out um I had I mean it was bad it was bad my aunt Nellie saw me um a week after or so after it happened and she was mad that nobody had called her but I had begged them not to call her because it was drug related and and um she put me in a hotel room and she popped up to check on me and from South Dakota and she saw that and she took me back to Newtown and, and I left my kids one last time in December. So I was going to go Christmas shopping and I, I left Kylie high and dry at my, my aunt's house. I already had a drug deal lined up and had a hotel room lined up in December and got high and got reincarcerated and I had to call Kylie and I remember hearing her tell me how mad she was. She was crying. She was like, you left to get me Christmas presents and now you're not coming back and you have my basketball shoes and you're not coming back and why do you do this? And um, and I had an aunt that was terminally ill that had helped raise me and she had raised Devin actually and she, I was supposed to sober up and take care of her and I remember I called her and told her I wasn't going to be able to and the family didn't want her seeing me like that, you know, with the, the bumps and the bruises and the missing teeth. And so we decided it was best that she didn't see me like that. And I, I had told her, I was like, but just hang on as soon as I get out of here, you know, I'll straighten up. And, and on January 3rd, after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, it was um, decided that she wasn't going to make it much longer. And so I was fighting to go see her in Minot and I was told I couldn't because I was a flight risk because of the level of my addiction um my PO and and realistically so you know my kids weren't enough to keep me straight that plane or keep me home you know um so I wasn't allowed to so on January 4th of 2018 I called my aunt and I told her you know I was um I told her I will live a life to make you proud from here on out. And she said, I hope you do because you have such amazing children and you've missed out on so much of their lives. They deserve so much better than this. Samantha, they deserve so much better than this. You're so intelligent. You're so smart. I don't understand why you do this to yourself. And uh, she was a recovering alcoholic. And she said, I get the addiction of or the disease of addiction I get it I get it I. but if I can do it you can do it and I was like it's hard I was like I just wanted to die and she said no you don't because I promise you laying on this bed I thought I was so ready to die nobody's ready she said I remember you talking about your mom and her saying she was choosing to live she wanted to live she said right now Samantha I want to live I want to get you through this. I want to live, but I just can't. So I'm going to hold you to your promise, and you're going to live a life that's going to make me proud. Do you understand? And I said, yes. And I said, I promise you, and I love you. And and um, I got off the phone, and I was angry, and I uh, had to figure out a game plan. So I went in my room, and I was like, how am I going to do this? And I said, okay, so I'm going to get an evaluation. So I, I, I signed up to get an evaluation at West Central. And um, I make this game plan of how am I do this, and and, I, and I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm, like this, this has got to be it. And um, I remember when my mom was dying that night before. She, you know, she had told me a few weeks before that she had prayed for all this pain that she was feeling to go away. And God had taken her, her will to hate away. And she had said, that must have been the source of my pain all these years, baby girl. She said, I hated something or maybe I hated myself and I just didn't know it. And I remember the next morning, my PO came in and she said, Nellie's on her way. We've agreed to let you go and be at your aunt's bedside. 
and um, be ready to go so I go and I jump in the shower and I'm so I'm gonna I'm gonna show my aunt this list I'm gonna get an eval I'm gonna follow through with the treatment and this is what my goals are and I get in the shower and I remember I prayed to God you know I said my mom when my mom told you to take her pain away you took her will to be take my will to use away so I can I can follow through on this promise just just take it all away and um, I got out of the shower and I got dressed and and um, my case manager comes into the bathroom and she said Jeff I need you in my office and I said okay and so I go and I take my stuff into my room and I go into her office and she said she didn't make it and I said what she said 10 minutes ago she said that she took her last breath and the family just called and my Antonelli's on the phone bawling, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get to you in time. I'm sorry this happened. And I said, no, it happened the way it was supposed to. And I remember feeling this unbelievable amount of surrender. Like any addict wants to get sober. I don't care. It, it comes in different stages of our addiction. But I wanted to be sober. I just didn't have the will to what it had to do to be sober. And I remember in that moment, it was like a weight had been lifted. And I thought, like, all right, this is it. Like, it, it was like I'd given a second chance. Like, this is, the, here we go. This is this is where I go. I got I got to do what I got to do. And I wasn't crying, and my aunt was crying. And they said, okay, well, she can go to the funeral. Here's the plan. And, and I remember sitting there thinking, like, um, okay, you know, this is, this is it. You know, it's my time to shine now. <clears throat> I gotta be there for my kids. I gotta, I gotta do this, and um, it, it was, it's just, I'm, un, it's inexplicable to tell you this weight that was just lifted, like ten minutes prior. And I'll say, at the moment she took her last breath, I remember feeling this weight off my shoulders, and I remember thinking that like, I can do this now. Mm-hmm. Like I know what I have to do. I can do this. February 1st, 2018, the Governor's Wife Initiative, Free Through Recovery, comes in. Karen had, my Karen called me the night before, and she said, just give it a go. Call Charles Dale. Just, um, he's been trying to get a hold of you since you got out of prison. It's four years of the 21st century program. You know, just give it a try. They're under this Free Through Recovery. And I said, okay, what do I do? She said, get a hold of your PO. So February 1st, it goes into, it goes into play. So I go to my PO and my PO's like, I've never heard this. Let me check and see what I've got to do. And she checks into it. And um, I think less than two weeks later, I'm signed up. And there's Heather Demery, my niece. And she's like, I'm going to be your care coordinator. And I meet with her and Charles. And I remember I walked into the office and, and Connie Ash is sitting there. And they introduced her. And I remember she gave me this hug. That's another inexplicable feeling was... She she hugged me, and I remember it, it felt like just the best feeling in the world, like I was home. Mm-hmm. And uh, she had asked, you know, all, you know, asked some questions, and she said, oh, well, I'll let you go to your intake, so I do my intake, and, and I just realized this, like, these questions were some really good questions, and they were kind of awkward to answer in front of Chuck Buck. <laughs> Because it's a man, and, and, you know, Heather's like, okay, so we're just going to start with the heavy stuff. You can be completely <laughs> honest. And anybody that knows Heather, she's just bubbly and smiling, you know, and she's asking these questions like, have you ever been sexually abused? And she's got this look on her face, and I'm like, I can't even deal with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? And I was like, how do you ask that with just this bubbly spirit? You can ask, and I look over at Chuck Bob, like, I am not asking, like, I know Chuck Bob, I know Fred, I know all these boys, I'm nine, he's like, it's okay Sam, I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here, but I'm not sitting here, and I'm like, oh my god, I was like, yes, I've been such an atheist, <laughs> have you ever been great, just, let's, let's talk about some traumas here, don't you, and Heather's just going for it, I just like, dove into <laughs> it, huh, <laughs> like, bro, I mean, it was, it was crazy, and I, and I started, I finished my intake with them, and I left, and that was it. That was that was it. I, I was 
in an IOP group for treatment. They, that program made sure I got to every treatment. I remember the bridges were closed to a winter storm. I told Chuck, I was like, I still have treatment today. And he was like, he brought the four wheel drive pickup. He was like, well, let's go. <laughs> you know, and no excuse to fail because they, they were, they were there and, and, and that program showed up. Yeah. They laced up and they showed up and they got me where I needed to be and, and they were my first rental references. My first job references, um, they really got me got me through it. And by the end of that year, and in in all of this recovery now, I remember talking to the first lady, and she said, "You know, you're, you know, one of the first two participants that we had from free through recovery that went all the way through from program to program completion to uh, peer support and care coordination." And I was like, what? And she was, yeah. And um, I guess I never realized that. And and I'm just in awe of it because all these milestones I've acquired in my recovery and, and you know, being a speaker at Recovery Reinvented, presenting Tila two years prior to that with the award, mm-hmm. all these stories that have opened in my recovery that wouldn't have been possible, getting my kids back in my life, my son's in med school, I have my 16-year-old daughter, my 13-year-old daughter is back in my life, my youngest son that I lost when he was two years old reached out last year and, and told me he still loved me and that we would work on our relationship at some point, and we haven't done it yet, but um, I know I have that opportunity with him, and I'm working for the tribe, I'm making good money, I have health insurance, I'm financing <laughs> car looking at financing a house like um completely humbled by everything it just took you know the warriors of taking a chance on me connie azure is my supervisor and she has been nothing short of amazing as a mentor as a sister in all of this you know she's she's a big part of my recovery while variety um getting in touch with my cultural identity, uh, being able to help my own family members and, and other people into recovery and just, you know, hopefully, you know, telling them my story like I do, like I was a fallout junkie and, and here I am spent, you know, lighting Christmas trees with the first lady and being honored as a recovery warrior, you know, last year and and thinking, you know, I would have never thought this was possible five years. Five years ago, I would have thought for sure I would have been six feet under because that was the goal. That was that was my goal five, six years ago. Was I wasn't supposed to be here. And um, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm humble. I'm just a grateful addict in recovery because I know tomorrow's not promised. And today can get busy and, and chaotic. But I remember that, you know, just like that saying is, remember there was a day when you prayed for everything that you have to be and to be grateful for that. And I am, um, yes. I took a lot of trauma. I took a lot of overcoming. I'm still in trauma therapy. Um, I'm still confronting my demons. Um, addiction doesn't get easier or the recovery doesn't get easier, but my, you know, worst day in recovery is better than my best day in my active addiction. And, and I, I'm, I'm not enslaved to that needle anymore. And, um, you know, I, I you know, the money I'm saving on my drug addiction, I'm spending on me and my daughter's DoorDash addiction. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's not bad. <family. laughs> <clears throat> Food. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, man, Sam, like your story is so amazing. You know, just like so many other people out there that I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that we can get um, many more people at Recovery Roundtable because man like stories like this are they're amazing and you know i didn't even know you know sam being my friend and i've known her for a really long time like she mentioned in the beginning and not even knowing like all the traumas that you've been through sam like and just being so honest with everybody about that like that's more than amazing i i i don't even know how to express that feeling and it makes me you know, hearing things that you went through, like, it hurts my heart to hear that, you know, one of my good friends um, went through that, and, but it also makes my heart so happy, so overwhelmingly happy to see where you are today, and coming out of that, because, 
you are living an amazing life right now and there are so many people that I know in my experience working with you even in a professional way that you have helped like you know you're you're one person that has been out and you have I mean talk about like boots on the ground in the trenches you know Sam has been there she's done that and so many people that I've worked um, with her um, for you know either directly or indirectly it's just I mean she, you've really touched a lot of lives Sam and I'm just so grateful I'm so grateful to know you I'm so grateful that you are still here in you know with us on this earth because I mean and you bring a lot to the table you're so compassionate you're just you love everybody and it's just amazing like I don't even know how to share my thoughts so but it's just like if you were here right now I would just be hugging you eh, you know but um it's just I don't know it's amazing and it just I hope today that your message you know gets to somebody that is feeling that same way that you felt in those moments and give them hope and inspire them and just kind of give them their second wind to you know reach out and get help because it's there it's there it's there I promise you it's there you know sometimes I think um, <clears throat> um, people reach out and they don't get connected to the right resources in time and that's unfortunate because we we have lost a lot of people especially I know in particular you know with MHA we've lost a lot of people um, sorry I have to plug in my computer at the same time as I'm talking um, because we haven't gotten to them in time and you know I know we talk about that window of time and at the same time I feel like the individual also has to be ready right there's that window of time where they're ready and um, you know getting people help so you know if at any time you know somebody is watching this if you feel like you need to reach out to somebody um, Sam are you somebody that they can reach out to message um, email call you know walk in wherever you're at is that something that you're able to do is provide oh, that yeah. support oh yeah I mean yeah. I, I've, I've gotten I've gotten a call of, um, I mean I, I I get all kinds of crazy crazy things you know I I need an uber um, I need you know and or I feel really lost right now can we catch a meeting and yeah and I'll say, yeah, you know, let's go, let's go catch a meeting. And, and then sometimes you get them and they're just like, well, I don't want to be in front of anybody right now. And I'm like, hey, man, we just need the two of us, you yeah. know, and I've gone to, gone for coffee and we've been at Perkins. I've gone to Denny's, you know, I've met with family members who have said, you know, how do we, you know, how do I help this person? You know, here's my loved one. Um, I... I have even, you know, as of recently, my brother Justin, and, and, and you've, you've been there with me working with Justin and Jeremy and, you know, striking while the iron is hot. I mean, you know, with Justin, um, he went to treatment this last time, and I remember he goes, it is, um, I mean, the girls went to visit, and for, he looked at me and he goes, man, I am finally, I can finally tell you this. I was like, what? And he goes, this is the first time in two, three months I'm actually happy to see you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, mean, I, went, I went above and beyond to get that boy. Like, I mean, I just, just I mean, he made me work. Sorry, right? Justin, we're I putting you on blast. Just, just put your recovery in me. You know, I love you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And man, I mean, I was, I was on him. Jeremy, you know, anybody that, any of my loved ones, even if I don't even know you, I'm down for a hug. I mean, I broke so many COVID policies. During, during lockdown yeah. where if somebody would call me and, and it was hard during the pandemic. Yeah. It was so hard during the pandemic for a lot of, you know, even us in recovery. Like I, I bumped my trauma counseling up to like two times a week. Um, it was bad. And I remember it, um, I was in a relationship and we were at my apartment in Bismarck and it was just him and I and, it, and this, my phone rang at 2 a.m. and it was a friend of mine I'd used with. She just got out of prison she took off in the halfway house and I was her peer support specialist and 
I knew that she's on missing stay called me and I and she called me at two and I she was crying and scared and what to do and I really want to get high or I can just go surrender. And I said, I think you just need a hug. And she said, What? And I said, I think you just need a hug. And she cried and she said, I do. Mm-hmm. And I looked at uh, my significant other at the time and he goes, you're amazing. And I said, what? And he said, go. Because I was just going to wake him up and tell him, you know, like, I'm going to run. And he was like, go. And I kept her on the phone with me and, and she told me where she was. And I get there and I said, did you get high? And she said, no, it was right there. It was either get high or call you. And I, I'm glad I called you. And I said, okay. I said, so here's the deal. I said, they know that you absconded. And I said, they're probably going to send you back. I will be here when you get out. I'll be here even if you don't go back. Well, we're just getting you out alone. And I said, I'm so proud of you for not getting high. And I said, you know, what can I get you? <clears throat> and she wanted to pack cigarettes. And I called the halfway house. And I said, I have her with me. She's going to surrender. I said, I'm going to stop and get her some food. I'm going to stop and get her something to drink. And I, we will be there to surrender her by 5 a.m. And I said, okay. And um, we went to Denny's and we, we ate and we talked and we kind of got what was going on on the table. And sure as heck, they sent her back, the OCR, but they released her. And to this day, I'm so proud of her through through um, going through F5. She's, she's still sober. That's awesome. And to see her in recovery is somebody that I used to just get super high with all the time. And, and, and those are the people that I've worked with that I'm in awe of. You know, right now I'm writing a letter of um, a letter of uh, support for somebody that I used to sell drugs with, but she got indicted and went to prison, and she came out kicking butt. Still, a person that you know, I'm so proud of you, Sam. I'm so proud of you. You're so beautiful. And I mean, she saw me in the depths. I mean, me and her. I mean, we, man, we we bottomed out. Like she went to federal prison. I went to state prison, and. I mean, but to see us both in recovery now and, and to be able to write this letter, this character uh, character letter for her, yeah. I'm just in awe, you know, because I'm a three-year board member of, you know, legal services and um, how I turned, I you know, I sat there and she wanted me to write this letter and I was like, really? You know, Judge Holman's going to see this and he's going to be like, oh, okay, you know. Just a quality person, you know. What I said, I still kind of hold myself. I was just like, you know, I, 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 I just never thought that I would be able to write this. So, I'm writing this letter, and those are those are the people I love. You know, anybody getting sober, but if I know you and I know the quality of person, I would say I'll go 110. You know, it, it, this field is not for the weak. So I'm really proud of you know Miranda and and, and Brooklyn. The the early starts of MHA recovery. Because you guys were boost on the ground as well. I remember sitting at Good Road when we only had, what, four people on the men's side trying to get a peer support council <laughs> off the ground. <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, oh, man, that was tough. I mean, that was way in the beginning. and But those conversations were so worth it, you know, because now they have become so much more. And there's so many peer supports out there. It's amazing. Not just within the tribe, but also on state side. And that's something... You know, I'm really hoping that um, all the other tribes, you know, uh, I guess I don't want to just limit it to, you know, the Great Plains, but just everywhere. But because we work here, I really hope that we can get a lot more people trained um, and certified in peer support, recovery coaches and, you know, in these positions where we we can help more people. And so um, that's another thing, you know, if, if somebody else, somebody's out there and they're interested in becoming a peer support Reach out to Sam. Reach out to me. Um, I know. I'm just gonna name drop here, but um, I know Tila Baker is also a facilitator, and um, not sure if she's uh, trained the trainer. Yes, maybe. Um, but I know that she uh, does hold classes uh, for those certifications, right, Sam? I'm pretty yep, positive. Yeah, yep. her and Heather and are Heather, um, yep. since the get go have been um, trained to uh, their facilitators for for peer support. Yes, so we're really hoping to get more um, peer supports out there again. And yeah, it just uh, a lot of this stuff. I mean, a lot of the efforts towards building a recovery program, building recovery um, supports. I mean, it starts 
with nothing, literally. You start with nothing. You start with a handful of people that have the same goal and vision in mind, and you work together, and it's stressful, and it's um, a lot of work. It's tiring, but it's worth it. It's so worth it to see all the people that have made it and that are still doing what they can do, you know, to become sober and to, to go through their journey to recovery, right? Because it, it, it's not, um, it's not something that is like, okay, step, step one, step two, um, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go here and then I'm going to be fixed. And I think that's, um, something that needs to be kind of clarified is that, you know, when somebody goes to treatment, that's not a fix all. I mean, and there's a lot of steps that are involved and, um, you know, and having those supports and realizing that it's not just an individual change. Um, there's a lot of behavior changes, yes, with the individual, but whoever the support system is for that individual, there also needs to behavior, be behavior changes within that home or within that supportive environment where that person is going to go back into. And... Um, that's something that I really like to share and, and get that out there because I think a lot of times the expectation of families or loved ones is, hey, I'm going to send my loved one, my husband, my um, son, my daughter, my wife, I'm going to send them to treatment and then they're away to treatment for, you know, however many days or months and then, oh, yay, you know, so-and-so is coming back home. Well, they're coming back home into the same kind of environment and nothing has changed the family hasn't received any type of support or counsel um and so they don't know they don't know that there needs to be a behavior change within the whole group the whole support system and so i don't know sam is that something that you can that that you have experience with as well well yeah uh one of the things like i'm hearing um what we're not, like I'm a big person of, if we get into addiction and, and you get them into treatment, trauma counseling. Yes. Like as a family, individually, uh, you know, Prairie Summit's doing it, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the, um, get into counseling because one of the things I've seen a lot of is we get our people out of treatment, they go back into the environment and if they're not using there, they've damaged that relationship. So anytime, anytime there's a weird behavior, you're going to have somebody looking at you like, I'm not acting right. Mm -hmm. You know, did they relapse? And then you start going to the addict of like, I think you relapsed. You're acting funny. And then the addict in recovery is going, I didn't relapse. Do you want me to relapse? You know, because right. the family is, the damage has been done. Um, and then you've got the attitudes. I mean, you, we can keep putting us through treatment. I went through nine. Actually, I went 10 double digits to include this last one that I um, got sober with. But it, it finally clicked for me when I, when I realized if we're not healing the trauma, if we're not healing what got us into this self-medication, it's just going to be a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. And hurt people hurt people. Yes. And, and that's where my thing is. It's like if you've got a loved one that's, that's going through treatment, Get into counseling, individual, and with them. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if we can't heal as a family, then it's just a complete injustice to this whole treatment process because nobody wants to talk about it. Right. Nobody wants to talk about sexual abuse. Um, I've seen I've seen men as of recently that I'm starting to see a lot of that come out in their, their trauma counseling, and I wouldn't have even guessed unless you hear them share their story. Where they say, I was ashamed it made me less of a man because I was sexually abused. Mm -hmm. and they consented as if it, their body reacted as if it was something that felt good. So the shame and the stigma um, of not wanting to be portrayed as gay or all these things that males feel when they are sexually abused. So if we're not healing that trauma, if we're not healing the mental abuse, the emotional abuse, the physical <clears throat> abuse, the sexual abuse, the self harm, the self hate, whatever, whatever it is, yeah. um, we're not healing. We're not. We're not helping this addict. But a lot of that, we have to make our families uncomfortable. Our yeah. family has to realize our home wasn't a happy, healthy home. How many people do we see that we've got addicts that are struggling 
And how many parents, as I'm sure you've heard it too, Brooklyn, I did everything to raise this person right. Yeah. They had a good life, you know. Okay, this might not even only, they minimize it yes. because they don't stand it. So now you've got the addict who's saying, see, see, she thinks my life was perfect. See, see, yeah. she doesn't understand me. And and we put them right back into that volatile situation. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. I, I've, I've been through that, you know, personally, professionally. And I, I get it, and and it's something. You're right. It is really, really uncomfortable to talk about, you know, especially when you're talking to a parent or you know somebody that took care of you or raised you, um, supported you, you know, throughout your childhood or what have you, and um, making them feel uncomfortable. You know, that's something that we're all gonna feel uncomfortable talking about it, and it's not like. And it's not being done in a way where we're pointing fingers and saying, because of you, dee, 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 dee. You know, if you have somebody in there that is a good um, mediator, a good facilitator, it won't turn into that. Um, you'll have a, a really unique healing um, session or healing time, and it, it shouldn't become that, you know. And, and we all, one of the things actually that was brought up today, um, at the uh, SME school, I asked, you know, these these group of, of um, uh, I don't want to say kids because they're, you know, they're growing. Um, and so I asked them, I said, what is something that you would like to see um, in your community? What is something, a positive change that you would like to see or something that you would like to correct or, you know, kind of bring attention to? And one of, one of the answers was generational trauma. And that's so real. Whether we realize it or not, it's so, so real. Um, you know, we might all feel like we're just kind of going on our happy way through life. But we have these triggers, right? And we don't even understand why. Why am I so triggered by this? Why am I triggered by that? Um, you know, and it's... It, it could be part of that generational trauma. It could be something. And I saw something really cool, actually, and I, I wish I had it here with me, but it talked about how, um, you know, as a uh, uh, growing um, fetus, I guess, in your mother's womb, um, you are actually, you're part of your grandmother as well. You know, your grandmother is part of that. And so um, I'm really not good at explaining that. I wish I had that in front of me. Um, but, you know, you those traumas are handed down, I mean, passed down biologically. Um, it's, it's that biological memory that we carry those things. And, I mean, you can read on it. It's real. It's, 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 it's really, um, it's really interesting how that generational trauma impacts our DNA. And um, we don't even realize it. And so some of my triggers could have been related to something that maybe my grandmother experienced, you know, um, and not just me directly or my mother, you know, and not me directly, but I'm still getting these triggers and I don't know why. I have no idea why this is happening to me um, and why I'm reacting the way I am. So look into that, read into that a little bit. It's really, really interesting. Um, and so that is something that, you know, eventually I do want to talk about maybe um, you know, bringing a, a larger group together and having a discussion about generational trauma. And, um, you know, if, if, if they or their families or their support groups have sought out that trauma counseling and um, how it affected them, um, you know, after, after their sessions were complete or um, what they did after that as a family, to become healthier so um but man i just um i'm trying to think does anybody have any questions i definitely want to give our audience a chance to you know ask some questions um either to sam to me to you know any anybody else out there um let's see i don't want to put you on the spot kelsey but um i'm going to read your comment it says i've teared up multiple times listening this opened up my eyes to why people do drugs such a moving life story for sure and it is it is and and there's so many others out there that you know i i hope can share their stories as well and i just 
man, I really appreciate you, Sam. It was kind of short notice um, a few days ago, and I'm so, so happy that you agreed to meet today and share in detail, you know, your your testimony, your story. I guess that's one question I, I would like to ask you, Sam, because I know some people don't like to say story, and some people don't like to say testimony, and some just prefer one over the other. So what, how... How would I, um, how would I present that? You know, is this tell us your story or tell us your testimony or what your words are best for me as a, fa a, a facilitator to use? Oh, okay. So I'm comfortable with both of them. It doesn't bother me, but I'll tell you. <laughs> here's a telltale sign. If they have the problem with the word testimony, it's because they were an inmate just like me. <laughs> okay. But if they, if they, you know, tell your story, but I... It is a testimony. It's it's a it's a addiction is a lifestyle, just as well as recovery is. You know, I mean, our lives are living testimonies to to um, you know future generations. And I I wanted to be as transparent with it. So I remember my son asked me the same thing. He was like. Mom, my, you know, you such, you know, I'm so proud of you. It's, it's, it's my biggest, you know, my kids are my biggest fans when it comes to me being in recovery. And they're the whole reason I'm so transparent with my testimony, with my story, because I didn't want anybody to come at them and shame them. Mm -hmm. You know, my 13 year old Jazzy just found out. She goes, they were in a computer class and they were told to Google their parents. <sighs> Oh, my up. yeah, first, and, you know, but now that's being replaced by recovery reinvented. I, I you know, I, I've done really commendable things. Uh, when the VAWA Act went down in 2013 and they were talking about discontinuing it, yeah. I, I have involved me, invited me to a round table to share my domestic violence story to, um, inspire the VAWA Act. And, and I was willing to go testify, you know, in front of, in front of legislation and, and I did. Mm -hmm. about my story with domestic violence and when you googled me that would pop up and then then my mugshots came and you know my my stories of of you know this aren't man and woman most wanted for this and this and, and now it's being replaced again with recovery reinvented and um sharing my story on facebook lives and my testimony and 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 giving excerpts of 25 years of addiction and um and I wanted that transparency so nobody can shame my kids, you know. So when they Google it, you know, Jazzy was out there and she was just like, oh, my God. And I was like, what? And she was like, really? And she was explaining one of the mugshots she saw. And I started laughing. And I was like, yeah, that was me. You know, yep, yep. <laughs> and um, her darn uncle and sister ran a running joke with her and uh, told her, <laughs> Uh, do you remember this Mexican guy hanging around the trailer? And mm. Jazzy was like, that's all her child. It's just like, no. They're like, oh, yeah, that was your real dad. And he was like, with El Chapo. <laughs> he started laughing. So now Jazzy thought I El Chapo fixed. Oh, my gosh. Like, oh. And we could laugh about it, right? Yeah. And I told her, I said, I said, even El Chapo has a testimony, Jazzy. He's got a story, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you that's, know? that's probably and true. That's just something we have to normalize, like, you know, being as transparent, if we if we want these future generations to learn from our stories and our testimonies, it's it's we got to cover the hard stuff. You yeah. know, we came from modest elders who don't like talking about that stuff, right? And and it's um, with the generational trauma. You know, my mom went to boarding school. I mean, that's 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 how close in generations this, this boarding school. Yeah. happened was my grandma went to a boarding school my mom went to a boarding school so when I tell my kids I, I'm the first generation in in the family you know I, that that did it you know me and my me and my cousins and me and my siblings were the first generations to not go to a boarding school and, it, it, and you hear these stories of boarding schools nowadays and to realize that like that was just one generation above me yeah. that was two generations above us that's not that long you know mm -hmm. when I had to start healing as a person and realizing I had to put my anger with my mom aside it wasn't until I got to recovery to realize my mom had traumas too <coughs> yeah. she did the best she could with what she had was she was raised by my grandma and my grandma's because of her generation was 
Shush. This, this is a family thing. Yeah. We don't talk about this. Right. This is for public knowledge. You, we deal with this as a family. So my mom was self-medicating all of that away too. Right. And so when I started healing as a person and I don't have a mom and a dad, you know, after 18 years old and losing them so young and, and finally in my late thirties and early forties now finding recovery, realizing I spent so much of my life trying not to be the person she was that because I thought if I wasn't putting my hands on my kids, I was better than she was. Mm-hmm. But my kids are still children children of addicts. And so I hope my grandchildren have a little bit of a better life because of how transparent and open I am with my story, my testimony. And not only that, but that these generations of uh, multi generations, whether you're older than me, I, I've had I've care coordinated and peer supported people that were, you know, my mom's generation. I've peer supported their kids, their grandkids, and and I just, you know, I've sat there at family meetings of of you know interventions and and being like, hey man, like nobody wants to be here right now. Like I get it, like you know, and even when I did transports for people that we're going to treatment and, and they go in the bathroom like I know what they're doing they're getting straight you know it's that last high all I can do is make sure I got the Narcan I didn't scrutinize them for it you know it, it, you just whatever it takes to get them across that line and, and sit there and I would share my story with them on the way to Bismarck on the way to Minot on the way to South Dakota wherever they were going to treatment you know and they were just like holy smokes I was like dude I mean like this by getting working in recovery like it's it's not easy. It's going to be one of the hardest things you do. But when you do tell your story, get down to the nitty gritty of telling everything you can because you don't know. You might be impacting somebody's life. That light bulb might go off to somebody where it's just like, and I don't want people being like, I've had people tell me, oh, well, my addict, my addiction wasn't as bad as yours. I wasn't on the needle. Dude, I, I'm not judging. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not comparing. I'm not saying, oh, my life was really hard. Or I sat in treatment with people and they would, they would hear my story and they would say, well, how do you follow that? You know, my biggest thing was I ended up in here because, you know, I, I got to a fist fight at school and they found my pipe. And I, the only reason I got the fist fight at school was because this girl slept with, you know, my boyfriend. And I'm looking at this young girl and, I'm, and I asked her just point blank, well, the fact that she had taken your boyfriend, why did that upset you so much? And she goes, because it was my boyfriend. And mm-hmm. I said, but he made that choice. And and I, I I just wanted to motivationally interview her to a point of like where this was deep rooted. Mm-hmm. And she and and the deep root of it, we concluded, was she came from a fatherless home, so mm-hmm. that male was her male. That was her someone. Yeah, and became and took that someone from her. So that was traumatic. Like, no shame or blame in that either. Like, it may seem minor to other people, right. and it might seem petty to other people, but when that's yours and somebody takes it, I mean that that's trauma. Right. That's traumatic. Yep, especially understanding that person's background. Then, you know, regarding that um, situation or regarding that. Um, you know, the way she was brought up, if she was brought up in a fatherless home, I mean, that, to me, that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so, I did put a poll question out there, um, and I'm not sure if it'll post it right away or if it posts it afterwards, but um, the question was, um, it, uh, personal opinion here, uh, individual personal opinion, is, you know, do you feel it is appropriate to be fully transparent with your children? And so, there are, um, there are options. Yes, no, maybe, depending on um, age-appropriate information. And so if our audience is able to, um, you know, um, answer those questions, I mean, these are your personal opinions. It depends on, you know, how you feel about it. And so I really would like to get um, uh, people's opinions on on these topics because I think they're really important. They're really important to talk about um, that transparency uh, some of the other things we talked about was trauma counseling. Um, I just um, uh, I made some notes while you were talking. You know, user to dealer. You know what what that's like. How that you know trans transition 
um, transpired, you know, and then civilian to prisoner, you know, what does that look like? And then, um, you know, I, I'm really familiar with it's someone else's fault. Really, really familiar with that. You know, again, knowing my history, I, I did work CPS for a really long time and I, I worked with some really wonderful families and um, again, a lot of that generational trauma was there um, and that that was always one of the main, I don't want to say excuses because that sounds ugly, but it was one of the main things that, that people would say. Well, it's so-and-so's fault. Well, so-and-so would have been doing this. Well, so-and-so, you know, and it's like you have to take that responsibility at some point in time. Um, if you really, you need to be honest with yourself. You need to be, you know, transparent with the people that are supporting you and honest with them. Um, otherwise, it's just you're still kind of covering up and, you know, hiding these secrets. And what do secrets do? They keep you sick. So, yeah. you know, and... and so and it could it could make you physically sick you know it could make you physically sick emotionally psychologically you know there's a lot of different ways that it can and keep you sick and so just um yeah i just and that's something that i always talk about when when i'm working with people um individually you know in confidence i'm like you know um what you share is not shared with other people, but I really need you to be honest with me. I need you to be honest so I can help you in the best possible way that I can, right? Um, same thing, I'm sure Sam, Sam um, has the same experience, you know, like she shared, you just, you have to be honest and transparent. Um, so, I promised that I would try not to say um so many times. <laughs> and I'm like hearing myself saying it, so I'm, I'm gonna stop that. I'm gonna try to stop that as best as I can. So, um, just kidding. Um, there I go again. Meanwhile, I can't, I think it's, it's like a habit, right? It's like that, uh, pause, like a pause word or something like that. So is there anything else, Sam, that you would like to share, you know, with our audience, audience that you feel is super, super important, um, for both family members, for the person in recovery or thinking about, you know, transitioning into recovery taking that first step and um yeah just anything anything that you want to share for our listeners well for the family um i guess my my recommendation is is a lot of this is <laughs> i first feel it, it, it's a cultural identity that we that we lack it, it's I mean sweat works wonders and and I be humble be be grateful I, I you know me as the addict I, I know the shame I'm really grateful and know how lucky I am to have the family I do uh, we can because how us natives uh, get through our trauma even my son will tell you he was like we joke and we tease you know uh, my daughter and I, to this day, I, I mean, I, people will sit here. If you guys sit around me and my 16-year-old, they'll be like, you guys should have a YouTube channel. It's just like, Mom, please, please. And I'm like, no, no. Get your grades up. No. <laughs> yeah. But to the family, just just find find those resources. Find, reach out to those people, you know, because they would reach out to Brooklyn and, and you know, I would hear, I mean, she recovery sucks. They don't do anything. And, and so I called Brooklyn. I'm like, okay, so this person's in my DM saying, like, my daughter, have you seen her? You know, she's so social treatment. And, and you would reply back with, you know, I touched base with her. She's not showing up. If you can catch her, catch her, you mm -hmm. know. You know, we just had that common goal of, of, of hold tight. But there's also a point where sometimes you're just too close. You're, you're too close to the addict. And um, we as addicts lash out, we hurt, we hurt the ones closest to us relentlessly and and we do feel remorse and we do push away, we do lie, we do cheat, we do steal, we do things that we were raised better. Um, guilt sickness sucks. Um, losing losing everything pawning everything selling everything selling you know selling your body selling you know it's going to take us to depths of, of of situations that that we never anticipated this wasn't our end goal it's not fun 
it's not fun to us. Um, like I said, every addict wants to get better. It, you got to wait for that will. When that will, when they surrender, and, and I promise you, and I'm sure Brooklyn's seen it, you just, you just know. You know when you see it. Um, sometimes it's a glimmer. Sometimes you catch it when you can. And, and you know, I had a relative that would surrender every night at 8 p.m. knowing I couldn't get him to transport at 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. to treatment. Um, until finally... I hunted him down, and I, you know, he he was like, "Yep, yeah, I'll be ready at 5 a.m." And there I am at 5 a.m. with two hours of sleep because I just came off of a treatment transport, you know, from South Dakota, and I slept for a couple hours. And I'm ready to take him to treatment because I love him, and mm. and boom, he was running from me. So now I'm going to trap house to trap house to trap house because that that that's how I go. I go 110 mm-hmm. as because I was an addict. So to the family, sometimes you're just a little bit too close and I've seen that firsthand myself now um, where I've had to out, outsource with different peer supports or MHA recovery members because it's too close to home and it's okay to admit that um, we'll run you ragged an addict in, in active addiction will run you ragged in the hopes that you'll just surrender on sending them to treatment EDO, I've recently become familiar with the EDO process back home Um, I was actually able, uh, it went really, it it was really awesome because I, I, I know I made some headway in the process where I looked at the judge and he was like, well, where is she going to shoot, man? I'm like, oh, okay. She's going to Minnesota. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, you've been in touch with MHA recovery because when you sign these EDOs, you're you're signing to be part of the recovery. And sometimes that's the family of the addict. Sometimes your biggest chore, as hard as it is, because we want them to get better so bad, um, and you're too close to the addict, is relinquishing control to somebody you know you can do it. Tony Johnson, Jared Baker, uh, you know, Brooklyn, Miranda, all these people that have had experience <coughs> with recovery, whether they're still with MHA recovery. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in special projects and planning with Chairman Fox's team, and, and I still get recalls for recovery. Um, And I'm all for it because I want people to get better. Like, I don't need a job title. I don't, you know, we we don't, all of us working in this recovery, we we don't do it for the job title, the recognition. We don't do it for that. We do it because sometimes the family is just too close and you need that third party there. So to the family, the addict still suffering, you know, set your boundaries, reach out to the proper people. You know, I'm somebody that goes 110%, whether I know you or not, and chances are, with the length of addiction I have, I know the addict or I know the parent of the addict or somehow they were in my circle. It, it, like, it, it's just weird how it works. And I, I just don't do halfway. I, I, I listen to, I listen and I find that niche of how I'm going to get it, get them and, and, and I'm going to do everything I can. Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of, it, it takes a lot of surrender um, to pure exhaustion that I've seen family members. I've done it for myself. As a family member, I found a pure exhaustion to where I was crying. Like, I just can't do this. Like, yeah. I can keep my sobriety. My sobriety was never at risk. I was grateful for it. and But I was running myself exhausted because I was too close to the end. Yeah. I was too close. Um, I was I was broke down to tears, so I've seen that side of it. But don't lose hope. Pray, smudge, sweat. Start getting out there. Start don't treat it like a dirty secret because you know the addict that still suffers and I tell my kids that too like I didn't care how I was out there looking you know I didn't go out there and say like oh I would say I'm a mother first but I didn't care I was 86 pounds looking like a crackhead hanging out in questionable neighborhoods you know getting into fish fights and getting robbed and the lifestyle I was living so in my recovery I should be just as transparent like that was me that's not me now Mm-hmm. As an addict that still suffers, it's not uncommon to go to treatment multiple times. Right. Nobody likes treatment. <coughs> the last treatment I had was with Kayla King's group at West Central. It was all women. And because of my trauma of being raised by the woman that I was, I didn't trust women. So mm-hmm. for me to heal in a circle of women was what was needed. Like, I... At the end of the day, I know that's that's why Creator put me in that path was because I had to heal that trauma of 
being able to trust women because the one woman that brought me into this world and I was supposed to trust to love me unconditionally without without abuse or addiction, which nobody has a perfect, nobody has a perfect childhood. Mine's no worse, no less. It's just my childhood. God gave me those shoes to walk in and, and I, I laced up and I put them on and I walk in them every day. So I don't, I don't compare, but I just know as, as the addict, nobody likes going to treatment, you know? So if you've gone to treatment multiple times, then let's start looking at counseling. You know, let, let's get you on the insurance. And if you're not going to formal counseling for trauma counseling, let's find you a AA group. Let's find you a sponsor. Let's find you a mentor. Like mm-hmm. I said, Connie Asher is my mentor and she still is. I share an office with her, you know, and even this morning she was like, girl, I was like, what? Mm-hmm. She was like, you still need to work on reacting emotionally. Last week it was, you need to have healthy boundaries. And that's my workplace, my mentor. And I love working with her because she calls me on my shit. Yeah. And you need in your life, it doesn't need to be a formal therapist. It, it just needs to be that person that's going to call you on your shit, like, I get it. Treatment is not a fun place, but if you're there for the right reasons and you can take the lessons as they come, it's worth it. It's a victory. And in recovery, that's all we get. We get little victories that hopefully will build a mountain that we can stand on top of and say, I did this. I, I climbed over every adversity to get to where I am. And maybe I'm not making a million dollars and maybe I don't have the best vehicle, but I'll be goddamn, I have a roof over my head, I have a hot shower to jump in, I've got clean clothes to wear, and I've got somewhere to go, and my kids are educated, and they're getting educated, and one's a doctor, one's gonna, one thinks she's a social media influencer, (laughs) so be it, whatever. (laughs) Um, The youngest one is in robotics, and my youngest son is a student of life, who is just gonna figure his way throughout, and that's fine with me, my niece is a (laughs) nephew. They're they're precious and they're beautiful in all their forms, and I get because of my sobriety, I get to see these small things, and and that's what the one things you need to realize that when addicts get to recovery, small things like getting your license back, having a piece of crap car to drive that gets you to aftercare, those are big milestones to us. Yes. Like <clears throat> they seem so minor, so celebrate the little victories. And I promise you it's going to instill such a sense of pride and self-esteem that your daughter, your son, your father, your mother, like, those are my biggest things. I remember when Devin called me this last after my aunt passed away, and I was talking to him on the phone, and I just got out of aftercare or IOP treatment, and I couldn't leave center. I could only go to treatment, church, and back to center. I couldn't work. I I had to rebuild that trust with my PO that I wasn't going to take off. And I remember I called him, and he was like, but, Mama, you're coming back to us. And I was so mad. It was his senior year. I wanted to go watch him play ball, right? Wasn't worried about an eviction, but now that I'm sober, this is what I want to do. And it, because I'm an addict, I want it right now. It gave me instant gratification. Right. So I didn't get gratification, but I was had a phone because Devin flipped my head on it. He goes, but, Mama, six months ago, you, you couldn't even keep a phone because you had no money, right. you know, you didn't reach out to us. Now you have a phone to call us, and I can call and tell you, like, Mama, I won my game. Mama, if you listen to it on the radio, it's on this, you know, you can listen to me play. And I remember thinking, like, if that's all I get because in prison, I didn't have that. On the streets, I didn't have that. But I have that today, and he made me realize, and Kylie, too, she makes me appreciate all the little things in life. And what she's taken out of my addiction when I ask her questions, and she'll be like, gosh, this girl, it just gets on my nerves at school, and she's like this, and she's like this. And I was like, well, then what's going on in her home life? Mm-hmm. What would be acting out? Like, if right. you take yourself out of yourself right now, and you had to put your, yourself in her shoes, why is she acting out in school? Yeah. And and Kylie's like, okay. So she Kylie has this empathy and sympathy and compassion for people. Like, it's it's unbelievable. Because she hated me for five years, and she told me she hated me. When I came out of addiction and sobriety, she was like, I hate you. I don't trust you. I don't want to be around you. And I needed to hear those things because that's how she felt. But our little victories are when I get a sleepover with her for a weekend. Yeah. Uh, we're able to sit up and laugh. And even on our worst days, fighting with her about her grades and 
and realizing like I don't know what the answer is but I get to sit here and look my daughter dead in the eye and say like I don't know what the answer is because for a while I was parenting via phone I was parenting via letter from jail um and and I get to do these things and and those are the big things is instill that with the addicts in your life the things that they get to do remind them because not every addict makes it across the threshold not every addict is is going to survive not every addict is is you know by no means necessary and don't think i didn't try to kill myself numerous times in my addiction i should not be here but creator had a plan for me and i'm no better and no less than the other any other addict that suffers i'm just lucky by the grace of god i am lucky to still be here to tell my story and my testimony to celebrate the small victories of my kids' lives to have my son tell me like I have money in my account from when my son's working at late shift at the hospital and he said, Mama, can I order some DoorDash? Mama, can you can you send me like thirty bucks? I just want to get something to eat. I'm hungry. Did you just say do- Did you say Jordash or DoorDash? My yeah. DoorDash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Throwback. Oh I was wearing Jordan Jordan Ash. Ash. I don't know what I would say. What? I just, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big thing a long time ago. I'm not old. I'm 42 years old. Yeah. <laughs> it was cool, you know, back in the yeah, day, they right? They get to. That's what we got to celebrate with our addicts. Yes. Even if they're suffering, they yeah. get to. Yes. Like, I'm so proud I got to talk to you today. Yeah. Because you might not get to talk to them tomorrow. And yes. and the shame and the stigma that, that goes with addiction, we as addicts, we feel it. So I know as the family member of an addict, I know how upset you are with us and that you have a right to your feelings, but realize the audience you're talking to. Yeah. Right. And, and just know that you didn't do anything wrong. Like, I, I have to see that even though it's that sexually abused me. It was probably done to them. Right, right. And so this kind of goes along with a question that Kelsey had. Um, She said, uh, I have a question. For me, um, when I don't agree with the choices my family makes, I get automatically upset. I tend to have word word vomit and tell them what's on my mind. Is there something that I can do um, to approach this differently? Because I have a cousin who is currently on court-ordered treatment, and, and it was either this or prison. Is there something I can do to get my family together to work on this or give them a better understanding? I want to help in any way I can so um, they don't choose this life anymore. So uh, one thing, Kelsey, um, you have my contact information. You can always reach out to me too. Um, Something that, you know, I can come and sit down with you and with your family um, or, you know, you guys can come to us um, at the office, you know, whatever. Um, whatever your family prefers, whatever you prefer. Um, and then also, you know, Sam, what are your thoughts on that? So, like, I, I, I get it. Um, if you're given chances of court order treatment at prison, of course they're going to go to treatment, right? Mm. Um, and same with our EDO process on, on MHA Nation. You know, it's it, the EDO stands for Emergency Detention Order. So what it is, it's a, a family member with a supporting statement goes in, or even a loved one, a friend, somebody um, goes in, and, and they have a person supporting their statement of saying this person's really messed up right now. They need help. So now we're agreeing to issue a warrant for their arrest, hold them in jail until we can get them placed in treatment. So... I am a person that believes addiction shouldn't be criminalized. Um, it, it it's it's a disease, but in, in certain aspects, like with me, um, clearly I wouldn't have quit for that group one time if I hadn't gone to prison. I I had shown the courts I couldn't quit, um, and I even relapsed after prison. So it it it's it's a catch twenty two. There there. You're going to go to treatment, and if you're there for the wrong reasons, not because of surrender, but to avoid lockup, your chances of recovery are a lot less because of the intention of what you're going in there for. Um, families are, are going to hope to this. Um, your family's going to make you upset. And and, and there, my thing is, is you see a lot of enabling. Um, right now, I've done an EDO on somebody, and their families come at me and told me, 
you were just out there getting high with him. You were doing this. And instead of being the unhealed version of myself, I had to step back and I had to block it. Mm-hmm. Block, block that person because I don't own that. What do I own? I own my responses, right? And sometimes no response is the best response. That is a response. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to see family members that if their role in the family is to save this addict, help this addict, enable this addict, and you put the addict in treatment and they start getting better, that person has lost their role. Now they got to focus on them and their issues and their problems because generally you've always got that one or two people in the family that are going to just go crazy over this addict. Right. I have to her. I have to do this. I have to do that. You know, if I don't do this, and then and then they they heal. So then, what happens? Then now you've got this addict, and and you've lost your identity because they don't need your help yes. in in the that you needed. They used to. So subliminally and just based off of trauma based responses. You need to keep that addict a sick person so you can keep your role in their life. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yep. And that's, man, that's a whole nother discussion in itself, honestly. Um, definitely something that I would love to meet and talk about again. Because, again, th- that's a whole nother um, a whole nother level on that spectrum you know and so and it's true right. it's true it's true it's true and I shared in my last video uh, our first video about um, that behavior change right and uh, the family or the loved one um, having to change make changes along with the addict because th- otherwise you'll find yourself repeating motions and repeating actions that I mean maybe it's part of like PTSD but you know, you're wanting to get that same reaction out of that person. So sometimes it could be, you know, you have to go out and find the next person that needs help. Next person, next person, next, and you exhaust yourself. Or it could be you are um, um, testing that loved one. That's something I did. I'm not going to lie. I, I shared about it in the first video, you know, testing their um, uh, seriousness about becoming sober, right? You want to kind of push a little bit, pick, 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 you know, and just see. And that's something that I had to recognize in myself, and I didn't. I actually went through um, uh, counseling sessions, and I, and then it, you know, I talked about this, and um, then it was brought to attention, and I was like, holy crap, I didn't even realize I was doing that. I had no idea that I was doing that. And it's not fair to the person in recovery, and it's not fair, you know, to the, the other support systems around you, you know, to be testing um, that individual. And so, um, but that's just part of it. That's just, I mean, that's a whole nother part of that trauma-based response. And so, um, yes, I'm so glad you brought that up, Sam. And I yeah. made a note because I'm like, oh, we got to talk about this. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think with Kelsey's question, it's um, problem ownership. Um not you always have that one person in your family that's really rational that sees things and maybe it's because it's a cousin so it's on your generation you you can kind of like my brother cowboy first cousin cowboy but raised like my brother cowboy used to take my mug shots to my family and he was like don't tell me you don't see her strung out she's dying right in front of you and they were like no she's got thyroid problems no she's sick and i did have thyroid it got taken out um but I remember he was, he was just telling me, he was like, I remember just like, she needs help, you know, and he would get so pissed off. And, and now, you know, he's, he's struggling with addiction firsthand, too, within our family with, a, you know, another person. And and he was like, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I just, I, I don't know what to do. What is what is wrong with you guys sometimes? Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, because when we know better, we're supposed to do better, right? And so it's those super passionate people in our family that, that can see through our bullshit that are the most angered by our addiction. Yeah. And so it turns into a mudslinging match of like, um, and that, that'll tear the family straight up. So Kelsey just, you know what you know, mm-hmm. right? 
So you might be the best support person and you might be the reasonable, rational person. You don't have to do that. I told you so. I mean, if you want me to sit down with them and talk to them, like, I'm in Bismarck. Like, I'll tell them. I'll be like, if it was prisoner treatment, bet your sweet ass I'm going to treatment. <laughs> you know, if it's going back to prison and staying in a halfway house for six months, I'm sitting in a halfway house for six months. It just so happened that I made promises and my light bulb went off and, and I, I decided in that moment that that was that was it. I was done. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. But yeah, no. If we're given options of prison or whatever, those 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 aren't the most substantial boundaries to have with an addict. Yeah. They're they're always going to choose treatment. Yeah. Um, and and we've seen that so many times. You see them because I guarantee you, working in recovery and actually being in somebody in recovery, you learn. You come out of prison a better criminal, and you come out of treatment a sneakier addict. If you're in there for the wrong reasons. Right. If um, I was the person, I was the felon that was like, I could do time on top of my head. I could, I could, I could stand on my head and do this time. It's nothing. It's this, and then boom! I see my kids, and I'm like, time doesn't stand still. My kids were in. My oldest was in junior high, and now he is playing senior ball. And yeah, I need, needed to get my head out of my ass. <clears throat> but, but you know, with Kelsey, like I mean, I could definitely, I have no problem. Now with your family and being like, okay, what do we not? What do we not understand? Like, tell me, you know, because I I can keep it real, and I'm, I'll be like, I don't know you, and I don't know you, and I don't know you, you know. Right. But hit me with the hard stuff, like, and I will be as bluntly honest of like, oh no, no, yep. she's she's just going through the motions, yep. you know. Be careful with your investment. Be care, you know what I mean? Because we pink cloud. Anybody coming out of treatment, despite their intentions, we get on a pink cloud. Yeah. I'm sober, and a lot of things we don't talk about, body dysmorphia. Yes. When addicts get clean, we get chubby. I remember my dog, I mean, I have to be weighed, not looking at the scale, because my doctor felt it was a trigger for me, because he was just like, you're in a healthy weight. It's just, you feel that weight. You're so used to being so deprived. And it's just little modifications like that, that are those little triggers like you know i went i went in i'm like always a size five seven and right now i'm like a 12 14 sometimes a size nine and that's okay i'm fine with that like that's it i'm healthy because i deprive my body of nutrients so much like i went to prison 86 pounds i came out 186 no lie no lie <laughs> but um but with kelsey like it sometimes you just gotta find that third person it's frustrating because you're so close to the situation that you're seen as competition, you're seen as irrational, you're seen as, oh, you're just angry with this person, you know. Yeah. You don't understand, you know, and, and I do. I've been there. I, I, I've, I've picked jail over, you know, I picked a halfway house over prison. I picked treatment over prison, and I, and I still ended up in prison. Yeah. And I think it's good to also have an outside perspective you know our communities on the reservation are like there's they're so small there there's mm -hmm. such small communities and everybody knows everybody everybody knows each other and their grandma and their grandma's you know the name of their grandma's horse and so on and so on like it's we're so intertwined and our families are all intertwined right with community to community and so it is good in my opinion, to have an outside resource to come in and um, come in unbiased and have those conversations and be able to um, help family members um, distinguish what is enabling and what is support because it is really a fine line and it's unique, you know, to, to each situation. And so um, that's something too that I, I definitely want to talk more about. And um, right now, um, the Youth and Family Tree Program with Standing Rock Treatment Program, they have a Families Anonymous Support Group in McLaughlin. Uh, once a month, I think it's every third Thursday um, at 5 o'clock Central Time. And um, we'll also we'll be starting a Families Anonymous group on the North Dakota side in Fort Yates. Um, and we will have more details on that coming up um, in the near future here. And then if any of the other communities um, on Standing Rock or even Bismarck Mandan, you know, if you guys are looking for um, Families Anonymous groups, you know, reach out, let us know. Even if you just want to do one-on-one, -on -one, 
with you know myself or Sam or any other um, peer supports or recovery coaches that um, you just you need some guidance it's okay it's okay to ask for help not any one of us has every single answer to every single question so it's good to you know reach out and ask your questions it's okay and if I don't have the answer I mean I bet you I'm gonna get you your answer I will get you your answer and get back to you you know as soon as possible so um, next question really quick before we end because we're gonna have to end here um, thoughts on harm reduction what are your thoughts on harm reduction <clears throat> so I have a niece um, substance abuse and um, is a cutter and I actually recently had her living with me and um, it's a real thing and 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 my thing is I, I don't shame her on it I, I'm just like explain it to me you know mm -hmm. Like, explain it. It's just like, I've heard so much on the inside that the cut takes that inner pain away. And I'm like, okay, I can relate to that. And she was like, why? And I said, because when I was heavy on the needle, here's how I looked at it. It wasn't that I liked injecting mass amounts of chemicals in my body. It wasn't the high that I was chasing. I mean, it was to get better from being dope sick. But it was the poke of the needle, it was the draw of the blood, and it was knowing I had that control. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I was a traumatic, traumatized little girl who had no control. I was somebody, if you look back, like I used to um, trim my fingernails and my toenails really short to where they bled. It was a control thing. All these different things I've learned in my, in my counseling. Another thing too, Kelsey, maybe we're gonna get into counseling, because the best thing you can do to help somebody else is get yourself better. Yes. Like, don't, there's no shame. Like, anger management, all of those troubles, all of those resentments can be dealt with in some form of counseling, whether it's with a mentor, going to sweat, going to ceremony. Like, seriously, life-changing when you start working on yourself. Sometimes pe the people around you will just, like, domino. Yes. But with self-harm with my niece, um we had come up with something and I, you know, packaging rubber bands, like, you know, you can get them at the dollar store, see rubber bands, you always find like on newspapers and stuff. I used to have her wear one. And, um, I said, every time you want to cut, snap yourself. Mm -hmm. And if that rubber band breaks or we get to the end of the week, we're going to put it in a jar. And so we started doing that. And I said, do you see what I see? And she didn't get it. And we'd gone through quite a bit of them at two weeks, and 10, 10 days, 14 days. And she was like, no. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. And she said, what? I said, every <laughs> time you thought about cutting yourself, ending your life, hurting yourself, all those rubber bands in there show all the times that you didn't go through with it. Mm. And she looked at me, and she goes, oh, my gosh. And to this day... So now she's out of treatment now for substance abuse, eating disorder, and self-harm. She called me crying last night saying she really had wanted to cut and wasn't worried about the relapse that she had wanted to cut. <clears throat> she was just having a bad night. And she said, but I just wanted you to know I snapped my rubber band and it, I said, I need to call my auntie Sam. And she called me and we talked about it. And I said, now take that rubber band and put it in your jar I put another one on and she said okay and I said how full is that jar right now and she said I almost need a new one and I said all right so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna get you a new jar and in two months time I mean it, it, it's a real thing and I'm watching these scars heal on her because um she's very forward like if you call her and her shit she'll she'll show you like she'll surrender her razors to me she'll surrender all this stuff living here you know um her substances, I, I had to, like, tell her I knew she was high, and I would have to hunt them down and find them, but I would. And um, But when it came to her cutting, um, I said pain demands to be felt. I mean, if you can reiterate that to self-harm, pain demands to be felt. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I can relate it to is my poke of the needle is her cut of the blade. And so if we take that power of the blade away from them and you put it in a rubber band and you're able to look at something and say, those are all the times I wanted to end my life. Those are all the times I wanted to cut myself. And I didn't. 
because at the end of the day, when you cut yourself, and my doubt, my 16-year-old said it, she did it a few times, and she showed me, and I asked her why, and she said, you know, she explained to me why, and I said, so what I hear is you're cutting yourself expecting the other person to bleed. Uh-huh, okay. He, ha- he hasn't done it since. Same with my niece. As you're cutting yourself expecting the other person to bleed. And that hearing those words, it, 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 it clicked. Wow. And I what it is. Wow, yeah. That's a really powerful phrase. Just sitting back and thinking about that. And how many times, you know, um, have we, just as individuals, addict or not, alcoholic or not, have we thought that way? You know? Um, yeah. Yeah thinking about that is, I mean, it really brings something into perspective. So that was a good one. Good question. Really, really good question. Um, Let me see really quick. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, We have a comment saying, uh, being in situations where I had no control OCD, at least I have control of my surroundings and my environment. Yes. Yep. And that's, yep. So, absolutely. Um, So, I guess, I mean, we've been on for two hours and 15 minutes. I really hope that um, everybody has enjoyed their time. Um, If it's made our audience think a little bit, um, if you've learned anything, I really, you know, Give me some feedback. Give us some some feedback, whether it's positive or you know um, uh, need some f- critical feedback. I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with that. You know, I I want to do this um, in a good way to make sure that it's reaching people again in a good way, and we're healing. We're healing people. We're healing, healing families, individuals. Um, you know, getting this message out there that you know these things are real, and they do happen, and it shouldn't be a secret. As much as, you know, maybe uh, how proud our families may be, how successful, you know, addiction um, is everywhere. And, um, you know, we can't we can't help anybody uh, if if we're sweeping it under the rug, if we're keeping family secrets, you know. So, again, I hope everybody um, uh, just um, enjoyed the conversation. And I want to thank Sam, Samantha Lindgren, um, Flies to the Sky Woman, for allowing us this time and for her to just share, again, her story, her testimony, because it was very, um, it was very transparent, very honest, very detailed. And so um, one thing that I did forget to do here, because I was in a rush when we were starting and panicking because I couldn't get her on live, but um, I usually, you know, I want to open with a prayer. Um, but today it's okay, you know, we can close with a prayer and um, just show our gratitude, you know, show show Creator, um, talk to Creator, and remember that prayer is a conversation. There are no right or wrong words when we're talking to Creator. It's a conversation between Creator and ourselves. And so, um, you know, there's, there's not a, a written right way to pray. Um, you can just have a conversation, be open, and... Um, and talk to him, you know, talk to creator. So um, if we could just real quick, we'll, we'll close in a prayer and um, and wish everybody good night. So, Wakanta ka, Tungashala, God the Father, Grandfather, Creator, whichever name we all know you by, we ask you for healing. We ask you for strength and positive feelings to go about our days, especially strength, Creator, we ask you for strength. We ask our spirit helpers for strength to move on and be the best that we can be. We ask for strength to help others. We ask for strength to help ourselves so we can be the best that we can be. Um, Creator God the Father, we want to ask um, to bless everybody that's watching this today and everybody that's popped in and popped out. Um, and and everybody out there that hasn't been able to watch, um, but keeping them safe, keeping their homes blessed, um, and um, 
everything in a good way. Um, God the Father, we ask you to um, bless bless tomorrow, bless our days tomorrow, and any any and every upcoming days that we have. You know, each day is not granted to all of us, and there are some that may not see tomorrow. And so we want to ask um, Creator God the Father to um, protect each and every one of us here on earth and those that are taking their journey um, as we speak and those that are already in the spirit world. So that is all I ask, Creator God the Father. Um, and, and good night, everybody. And um, again, um, my name is Brooklyn Maxson, and we have Samantha Lindgren here this evening. And I just want to wish you all a very good night from my lodge to your lodge. Um, we are closing. So everybody have a good night, and God bless you. And reach out if you need help. You can message myself. You can message uh, Sam. And if we don't have the answers, we'll get you the answers, answers and, you know, we can get you to people that that can um, really um, help you. So, um, again, good night. And we'll see you all next week on Recovery Roundtable. Good night. Good night.